good afternoon, good morning, good night. So, buenas tardes, boa tarde, buenos dias. So, today we have the pleasure to have uh, here Professor José de la Rosa from uh, CNM Seville. I remind all of you also that if you want to receive more news about uh, activities, uh, you can uh, do a subscription to the YouTube channel. So thank you very much. And now uh, the floor is with Sandra to present uh, Jose. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction, Professor Ricardo. It is a pleasure to be here uh, as a host, and uh, we are really honored to have Professor Jose de la Rosa with us. Uh, he's, uh, as uh, uh, Professor Ricardo uh, told, is is from the uh, Seville University, and he's also a IEEE fellow. So it is we are really honored, and he brings us uh, this uh, very interesting an important topic that's about the analog and digital interfaces in in this uh, down of IoT. Thanks, Professor. Please. Uh. Okay. So, thank you very much for your introduction, uh, Sandro, and also Ricardo, and uh, for inviting me to to the, to give this this talk in this uh, very interesting initiative uh, of uh, Rio Grande do Sul chapter and CAS society. I think that in these times of uh, pandemia, uh, pandemic uh, that we are living uh, around the world, uh, it's, uh, it's a great uh, initiative. So, uh, as, as you say, good, good morning, uh, uh, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, uh, wherever you, you are attending this conference. Uh, indeed, for me, it's uh, it's also a great honor and a great pleasure uh, to to give this talk uh, for this reason that I have mentioned, but also because indeed, uh, uh, let me check this. Uh, it was around uh, 25 years ago that uh, I had my first uh, IEEE paper published uh, in in a conference that was held in, in Brazil as well, and in particular in Rio de Janeiro. And it was a paper in Midwest Symposium Circuit and Systems. Here you can see the, the paper. And indeed, I was uh, presenting um, uh, also, uh, of course, a digitizer and analog to digital converter uh, that you can see here the, the chip and some experimental results. And it was uh, an, uh, an ABC also for, for digital radio receivers which in those times uh, was also a cutting edge, uh, you know, applications. And as yeah, you can see in the experimental result that uh, this was a digitizer, it was able to digitize signals, plays and one megahertz um, <clears throat> band, no? and the frequency band, no? which was in those times, <clears throat> it was a uh, emerging topic and a cutting edge uh, technology. Indeed, we were proposing new and uh, thicket techniques like current modes with current. And here I, I am uh, 25 years uh, later uh, uh, talking about uh, digitizers. No? Uh, so this paper it was also uh, part of uh, the work that I was doing as uh, in my PhD <clears throat> together with my, my dear colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Fernando Medeiro who unfortunately passed away some, some time ago. And we were both <clears throat> PhD students that were uh, supervised by Professor uh, Angel Rodriguez Vasquez and uh, Blaine Perez Verdu. And uh, it was uh, indeed, I can see that it was the, the beginning of uh, my academic career. No? Uh, so I'm very glad to, to be again virtually in, in Brazil, but uh, in, in an event uh, organized by Brazil in this case, by Rio, Rio do Sul uh, chapter, no? So in the last, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, 25 years, we have been designing uh, ABC, mostly simulator converters, uh, sim simulator modulator types, uh, and, and targeting a number of uh, applications that you can see here in, in a summary, uh, that uh, indeed uh, show in, in most cases uh, state-of-the-art performance, or a number of applications that were published in, in 
you know, uh, state of the earth uh, and cutting edge uh, publishing, uh, like uh, Journal Solid State Circuits, uh, TICAS, and other, uh, you know, uh, good uh, publishing. And this uh, uh, state of the art designs were supported by CAT, CAT tools. And some of them, like uh, SimSize, which is a behavioral simulator, which is available for free. And it is used uh, every day by, by many people around around the world. No? So this is also very important no? because uh, we are also providing not only you know the you know the, the results of our research, we are sharing the results of our research, but also we are uh, also sharing the you know the, the our design methodologies and tools and cut tools that are, are very in, 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 it can be helpful for many people in academia and industry to to do a state of a state of the art uh, design. No? So this is also important. So I'm here uh, to talk about, uh, as is mentioned in, in in my introduction, no, in the in the title no, of of my presentation, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, analog digital interfaces in this area of digital transformation. No? So this is the outline of of my talk. So I will start uh, talking about what uh, digital transformation means. And we'll take a look, a close look to, to the, uh, a quick look, quick look about, about the fundamentals, the basics about uh, analog to digital converters and state of the air. So I apologize in advance uh, for those of you who are attending this, this talk, who are experts in the topic of uh, ADCs because I am talking for a general audience. So I don't know uh, uh, what you know about uh, ABC. So we'll start from the from scratch. But I will be very quickly giving the, you know, the, the, the fundamentals and the, and the basics of, uh, of ABCs. And in the second part of my lecture, uh, I will give you some of my visions and about the emerging trends uh, and techniques and some design challenges in this uh, very hot topic, which is uh, the analog to digital conversion in this uh, uh, you know, uh, digital transformation that we are living in, in, in our society. Now. So what the first question is, what does a digital transformation mean? So when I was uh, trying to you know, see uh, or to think about this, you now uh, I was uh, indeed uh, reading some interesting books and uh, inspiring uh, uh, readings, like uh, the ones that I'm showing here, like the, this book by Professor Daniel Bell from Harvard University, and later this uh, the, this book that was published in, uh, last year by the, this uh, visionary uh, Thomas Thomas Sewell, no? uh, uh, was titled Digital Transformation Survive and Thrive in, in an Era of Mass Extinction. And indeed he was referring to the to you know to 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 this uh, how to, to how the, the the global economy has changed uh, uh, over the history of humankind no? from the pre-industrial society to the post-industrial society. Indeed the term post-industrial society was coined by Professor Daniel Bell. So this is important in order to, to, to get a perspective of the, um, what does uh, digital transformation mean to see uh, where we come from. No? So the, in the pre-industrial society, uh, you know, the main resources were natural resources. So we were, uh, you know, the humankind extract directly uh, the, you know, the resources from the nature, no? by fishing, mining, and agriculture. And in the industrial society, we use the machine. So we, it was a game against the, the, the fabricated nature. No? The, so the main, the key player was the, you know, the, the, I mean, the mechanical uh, machines, no? as you can see in this, in this picture. And the, as a result, we have a, a number of goods production no, that were manufactured by these machines. No? So in that post-industrial society, in that in which we are now uh, living on, and the main resources uh, come from knowledge, come from education. So the production is the information production. So this is the result of the, this is, these are indeed the, the, the result of this, um, the outcome of this uh, uh, digital uh, economy in, this, in the post-industrial uh, society you know, that we are living. So in this works, uh, they identify what we call it the wave of innovation. 
and they identify that the way of innovation the key players here are the digitalization plus the internet is what is uh, uh, leading us to the digital transformation also in these studies as in others that you can see there are a number of data uh, uh, that show how uh, information technology it's uh, indeed uh, has a strong impact in in our society you know you can see that this data indeed were uh, obtained before the pandemic uh, you know times now so I, I i guess i don't know but i guess that even even now maybe the, the this number will be even you know the, the impact of the information technology in our lives it will be even stronger uh, the, the numbers shown here, no, about the impact that they have in the in general in the economy, no, because uh, due to the situation in which uh, all the, the, the you know of the globe is uh, living now, the uh, the information technologies are becoming more and more uh, important. No? So there are a number of uh, what they call it the technology vectors, no, like uh, cloud computing, big data, the Internet of Things, or the Internet of Everything, artificial intelligence, that they are calling disruptive uh, technologies which are driving us toward this uh, what is called industry uh, industry 4.0 or the this post industrial society so the convergence i mean uh, how this uh, uh, technology driver these technology vectors are being combined is giving us to a new kind of devices new kind of applications based on the so called cyber physical physicals uh electronic devices in which uh, there are new technologies which go from computation artificial intelligence machine learning uh, machine to human machine to machine communications which are uh, making possible the, the the i mean the the, the transformation from the internet internet of people to the so-called internet of things no? So behind all these uh, smart cyber physical devices, we have uh, electronic systems. And uh, in the, as these electronic systems process the information in a massive way uh, by using uh, digital signal processors. So the information, the signal processing is mostly done in the digital domain. But in order to interact with the nature, which is uh, inherently an analog uh, the, um, physical magnitude, we will need sensors and actuators that interact with the nature and we will need to transform this uh, uh, analog uh, uh, magnitudes into digital uh, signals in order to be processed by the signal by the by the system so, so analog to digital converter which is a, a key building block in these systems is the main topic of my talk today and it is a very basic a very important building block in any electronic system that uh, we can have nowadays in the in these cyber physical uh, systems so if you are going to talk about this kind of uh, building blocks uh, like uh, analog to digital converters you can focus uh, the discussion at different abstraction level no? you can talk about uh, at the system level you can talk about at circuit level or you can go down to the physical level so in my talk today, I will go to a bit mostly focus at the system level, and I will, uh, from time to time, I will just give some details about circuit level and maybe some uh, chips examples. But my my talk today will mostly focus at the at the system level, uh, at the system level, the um, uh, abstraction level, right? So let me start as, as I mentioned before. Let me start from uh, the basic, uh, uh, some basics, some fundamentals about uh, ADCs. As I said before, maybe some of you can skip this part of my presentation because our, it's very basic. But maybe there are other people attending this talk who don't uh, are not familiar with uh, ADCs. No. So let me define what an analog to digital converter is. It's a system that transforms a signal which is continuous. In, in amplitude and in time, as you can see here, for a sine wave signal, into a, a signal which uh, is uh, as uh, the time and the amplitude discretized. So we have two discrete, two continuous transformation, one in time and the other one in amplitude. And these two discrete, two uh, continuous uh, uh, transformation processes, which is one in, in time, which is a sampling, and the other in, in amplitude, which is a quantization, are the two basic process behind any analog to digital conversion and define 
the requirements and the specifications, the limits of any analog to digital converter. So the sampling process limits the input signal frequency due to the Nyquist theorem because uh, the, Nyqu the Nyquist theorem is limiting the speed of the, the max, I mean, the minimum speed of the converter in order to digitize signals without being corrupted by, uh, by dimensions due to the sampling process. And the quantization process it limits the resolution, I mean, the accuracy with which you, uh, you are, your, your converter is digitizing the signal. So it's very common to place the state of the art uh, analog, on analog to digital converters in the speed pressure resolution plane. So if you take a look here, where you can see the different uh, kinds of uh, converters, and uh, you can see how the so-called Nyquist rate, I mean, the ADCs which operate at the Nyquist rate uh, uh, sampling frequency, covered a very wide region, very wide conversion region, and the so-called uh, oversampling converter, which are mostly implemented, implemented using oversampling, uh, I mean, sorry, sigma delta modulation, which is the yellow uh, rectangle, is covering indeed the widest conversion region in the, in the resolution versus uh, bandwidth versus speed uh, uh, plane, as you can see here. No? Indeed, it is interesting to uh, take a close look uh, at the state of the art on, on data converter before uh, starting to see uh, to identify some uh, some important things about the, uh, the digitizers in this, uh, which are more energy efficiency. You no, know? so the first thing that we have to think about is about uh, the metrics that uh, allow us to compare the performance of different ADCs, and one of them is of course the and the conversion energy, which quantifies the amount of energy that is consumed per converter sample. So it's a power consumption divided by the Nyquist, uh, the Nyquist sampling rate. So based on this uh, energy or conversion energy, you can define there are two main features of uh, merits which are really uh, known as uh, forms, which are used in order to compare the performance of different uh, ADCs. First one is uh, one of the most used is that it, it was that, uh, that proposed by Dr. Walden and the, by the end of the, in the 90s uh, of the last century, which is defined by the energy divided by the resolution, not to uh, the power of the effective resolution. And the other form is what initially proposed by Dr. Rabi and Professor Woolley from Stanford University and was reformulated in DB by Dr. Schreider and Professor Temes. And it's measured, it's a me metric that measure the efficiency of an ADC in terms of its noise spectral density. So just to give you an idea, depending on the noise uh, spectral density that you have, uh, this gives you an idea of the power consumption and of course of the, um, the, of, of the energy that is consumed per conversion. No? So in general, uh, you can use both features of merit, but uh, nowadays uh, most uh, state-of-the-art uh, designers prefer to compare the performance based on the uh, Israeli, the so-called Israeli form, which is more representative of the edge of the feasibility than the, than the other form. But anyway, both forms are used for are useful useful for comparing the, the performance of uh, ADCs. No? So it also it is also interesting to to get the historic pers perspective of the energy consumed by uh, ADCs. So. If you take a look at the energy consumed by ADC in the in the nineties, you can see how the 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 and you can see here in this plot the energy versus the resolution, and you can see how you, you could obtain depending on the resolution. The higher the resolution, of course, the higher the energy that you will need in order to do the the the, the, uh, the analog to digital conversion, and you can see how in those times. Uh, the most efficient uh, ADCs in terms of the energy consumed, I mean, the consumed energy was in the order of a nano, nanojoule. So if you look, take a look to the next decade, you can see how the, the result, I mean, the energy was uh, getting down. And if you look at the last decade, it's getting down and down. No? So now there are uh, some data converters, depending, of course, of the uh, target specification that you are looking, looking at, uh, that uh, are able to digitize signals with uh, an, an energy uh, which is uh, so low uh, as uh, in the order of picojoules, even, even lower, not even, even lower, in, in the order of 1.1 or even 
some, in some applications close to the femtojoules uh, nowadays. So it's, uh, it's curious to see how the energy is, uh, I mean, decreasing no? uh, over, the, over the time, thanks to the effort and thanks to the research uh, innovations carried out uh, by designers of uh, analog to digital converters. What we are comparing here are all the kinds of uh, ADCs in terms of the energy consumed by, I mean, that they consume depending on the resolution. No? But it is also interesting to have a close look to those kind of converters which are indeed the most efficient in terms of energy. And these converters, of the, the, in the, uh, as we will see later during my presentation, are the Sima Delta pipeline and cell converters. These converters are indeed dominate the state of the air, so that if you take a look here to the symbols, you can see how uh, more or less they will be this will be more or less the region in which the IoT devices, the Internet of Things devices, are more or less moving, and depending on the, I mean, the specification of the application related to IoT. But you can see that in general, uh, if you are looking at uh, resolutions uh, in the order of 12 feet or lower, uh, SAR converters are in general more efficient than, than the others. But if you need a higher resolution, Probably the, you will need to, to use uh, a Sima Delta converter, no? And you can see also uh, here are some pipeline. And I will I will show you later on there are some hybrid converters which are uh, which try to take benefits from the different kinds of uh, of, te dif of these uh, techniques in order to get a more efficient ADC. So let me talk about uh, uh, some fundamentals, some background about. Uh, these specific uh, techniques, which are, as I said before, dominating the, the, the state of the air, no? which are SAR, pipeline, and sigma delta. Indeed, the more direct way of digitizing uh, an, uh, a signal and the fastest way is if to, to, do the, to use a flash converter, which uh, implements a direct, uh, I mean, a parallel conversion. No? You have here a resistor lever that allows you to define. Um, uh, some uh, referent internal reference points, reference uh, voltages, which which you compare the input signal in parallel by a bank of comparators that gives you by using, for instance, a thermometer to binary decoder, give you a parallel uh, digital uh, world, and it is uh, uh, therefore it's the fastest way of uh, digitizing a signal. But the problem of the price to pay is the rest that the resolution increase in an exponential way almost uh, as uh, as the number of uh, comparators with the number of comparators that you are using so this uh, kind of converters are very fast but at the same uh, at the same time they are very power hungry no? so it's very limited in terms of resolution because you need to use a um, more uh, a large number of uh, uh, comparators and indeed uh, the analog portion of this uh, this uh, 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 architecture is in, in the analog domain. So there are some alternatives, which indeed are the ones which are nowadays dominating the, the, the state of the earth, as I said before, which are the, the pipeline, which is indeed an extension of the so-called semi-flash converter, SARC, ADCs, and sigma delta converter that I will going to, I'm going to, to explain a, a little bit more detail. But essentially, these three strategies use uh, the divide and conquer uh, strategy, they, I mean, these three techniques of them uh, are using the so-called divide and conquer uh, strategies. I mean, the trade, resolution, and probably speed as well, by signal processing, at the price that uh, they, they can reduce the, the, the power consume, I mean, the, uh, and the energy, at the price of uh, maybe reducing the, the speed or maybe reducing the, the, the resolution that they can target, no? but they are more more power and the, the most power efficient uh, as compared to the rest of the state of the earth or the rest of techniques uh, that are used to, to digitize signals. So let me give you some uh, uh, basic concepts, that some basics about, about uh, these main uh, techniques uh, for, for ADCs. Regarding the, the pipeline, let me start with the semi-flash. Now semi-flash, the idea is very simple, is to, to divide and conquer, as I said before, you use two, uh, two sub-converters a coarse and a fine uh, ADC, and uh, you, you, you extract the, res the residue, and you, 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 uh, you, you, you get a parallel conversion of the, uh, the result of digitizing the residue and 
with a, with a coarse converter and with a fine converter that you combine both the most significant bits here that are extracted from the coarse converter and the less significant bits from the fine converter and you combine in the, in the digital domain. So you can e e extrapolate this strategy to a multi-stage multi approach and this is what is called a, a pipeline. So I forgot to mention that this strategy of course is slower than a flash converter because it's operating in, the, in series instead of operating in parallel as a flash converters, but you can reduce the number of comparators, no? because uh, using these strategies, you are dividing, I mean, you are reducing the number of, drastic, in a drastic way, the number of comparators, and, and you can increase the resolution that you can achieve while uh, consuming, uh, let's say, a lower uh, power consumption. No? And as I said before, you can extend this concept to a pipeline converter. A pipeline is indeed an extension to multiple uh, stages, and each stage is operating like a semi-flash, you know? So there are multiple studies in which you, you can identify which is the optimal resolution for, uh, for each stage, but typically there are, the resolution per stage is in the order of two, three bits. It depends on the, the, the I mean, the architecture of the pipeline and the application, of course, no? So the other uh, strategy, the other technique is the SAC ADC, which is uh, nowadays one of the cutting edge uh, techniques to digitize a number of uh, signals in many, many different applications. And the strategy here is to reduce the analog contents almost to, to an, a simple comparator. And, and here you, you follow a, a successive approximation method that this gives the names to the SAC converter, known as a successive uh, uh, approximation uh, algorithm in which you are in a successive way approaching the, the, the input, uh, I mean, the input signal, I mean, the analog signal, in a successively way, you know, that you can using an algorithm, you're using a logic that is as represented here by this, uh, by this flow diagram, and you can see here in a graphic way dynamically how the, the 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 output of the converter is approaching in a successive way to the to the input signal. No, it is easier to see this uh, by following this explanation, this nice and didactic explanation that is given by Professor Abidi in IEEE. ATB, I recommend you to, to see this uh, nice explanation. And it is very, very simple. If you think about uh, this, uh, uh, you said this algorithm, like uh, to think about a piece of paper that you, uh, you, 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 uh, you let's, let's consider this analog input. And this is the main point. I mean, the, I mean the, you are in the middle of the reference, full scale reference. So in this case, if the input is below its midpoint, you will get at zero. Then do, you fold the, the, this uh, imaginary uh, piece of paper, and now the midpoint will be below the, the analog input, so you will get uh, an, a one, and so on. You fold the paper again, you will get uh, the now that the, the analog input is below the midpoint, you will get a zero then you will get a one and so on. No? So this, this is the logic followed by, in the majority of cases, to, to implement the SAR converters, which can be implemented using switch capacitors, as you can see here. Now, they will not go into the in and outs of the circuit implementation, as I said uh, at the beginning of my presentation, but uh, there are different strategies uh, for SAR converters in order to divide, you know, the, the, the multi-bit, I mean, the, sorry, the most significant bits and the less significant bits in the so-called segmented uh, DAX and symmetric uh, uh, ADCs in order to make, I mean, this, uh, to implement this logic in a more efficient way. This is more or less the general idea of SAR converters. So let me, uh, let me give you some general uh, fundamentals about the, the third techniques that I have mentioned, which is dominating the state of the earth, which is the sigma delta. Sigma delta modulation is based on two signal processing techniques. The first one is uh, the so-called oversampling, which means sampling the signal and a, a sampling rate which is uh, higher than the, the limit imposed by the Nyquist uh, theorem. And the reason for doing that, the benefit of doing that is that apart from relaxing the, the I mean, the requirement for the anti-aliasing filtering is that you can spread the power of the, of, of the quantization noise. Uh, you can spread this uh, quantization noise power in a wider uh, frequency, frequency band, in a wider frequency range. This is one of the benefits because you can reduce the inband noise power by a factor which is indeed the oversampling ratio. I mean, the ratio between the sampling frequency and the Nyquist rate frequency. And the other technique is noise shaping. I mean, this noise 
it can be filtered so that most of the power, most of the inbound noise power can be pushed out of the signal band, as you can see in this, uh, in this picture, so that uh, you can further reduce the, the, the inbound noise. So it can be a conceptual implement, as you can see here. Here you have the, the, the pulse signal, which is a sound wave. And here you can extract the quantization uh, noise. And here you can process, you can filter this noise so that uh, in a low pass uh, filtering or in a one pass fashion, uh, you can uh, uh, either, either let the quantization noise uh, be reduced in the baseband or being reduced uh, around a given bandwidth around a, a, a carrier frequency, for instance, in, 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 in RF receivers. No? And at the same time, you can take the, the, the input signal and process the input directly to the digital domain. So how can you put this, uh, this, all this together in order to implement this, uh, these uh, two uh, functionalities? I mean, letting the signal to pass directly to the digital domain and filtering in the, the noise, I mean, the, the quantization noise so that it's shaped so that is most of the in-band in noise power is shaped, it is pushed out of the signal band. So the, the way to do it is by implementing this uh, concept in a feedback system like this one, in which you have filter, a quantizer, which is made out of an analog to digital converter, which is typically a low resolution AD, ADC, and a feedback DAC, so that you can fit the, uh, the output back to the input and yet you can quantify the error. No? So that if you replace the quantizer by a linear model, you can analyze this, this system and get the signal transfer function and the noise transfer function so that if you design this filter so that you have a high gain in the signal bank, you can make the signal transfer function to be unity, or unity and you can reduce the noise transfer function ideally to, to be zero. No? Here you have some drawing of the first order in case of you, the filter is just a simple integrator in the discrete time domain, but you can uh, you know, increase the order of the filtering and uh, you know, get this uh, effect of the noise shaping uh, stronger and stronger. No? So in the end, the resolution of this kind of converter is a result of two sin these two signal processing techniques, I mean, the oversampling and the, the, the noise shaping, so that you have three basic ingredients, which are the number of bits of the quantizer, the order of the filter, and the oversampling ratio. No? So these are the three main ingredients behind the operation of this, uh, this kind of converters, which have, of course, of course, nothing is for free because the uh, oversampling is limited by the speed of the analog circuit. The order of the shaping is limited by the linearity, I mean, the, sorry, the stability of the system and the resolution of the internal, I mean, the embedded uh, quantizer is limited by the linearity of the feedback tag. So as I said before, nothing is for free in this kind of system in which in the end, you will get uh, the noise shape uh, uh, output, uh, uh, output uh, spectrum, as you can see here, for an impulse signal, which is a sine wave, and you can see how the noise, uh, the power, uh, the noise power is reduced in the signal bandwidth, and most of the noise power is uh, increased out uh, of uh, out of the signal bandwidth, so that they can be uh, cut uh, or cut off by a digital filter, where it's also downsampled using a decimator in the digital domain. No? So. This can be implemented in a, in a circuit level very, very easily. For instance, here you can see an integrator uh, can, be, uh, can be implemented uh, using switch capacitor very, very, very easily. And a quantizer can be a one-bit quantizer, which is a simple comparator, and that can be a couple of switches no? that, uh, in which uh, you can uh, connect or disconnect uh, the reference, I mean, the full-scale reference, depending on the sign of the output of the, of the quantizer. No? Nowadays, uh, most of the uh, I mean, state-of-the-art designs are using a continuous time uh, circuit techniques that are illustrated here for a second-order filter, as you can see in this sample node, uh, in which the integrators are indeed uh, active RC uh, integrators. Uh, and the reason for using continuous time and the motivation for many people using continuous time, not only in CMA Delta, but nowadays even in pipeline, uh, converters. Uh, indeed, there is a uh, talk that will be given by Dr. Uh, Hajim Shivata from Analog Devices in a few weeks. A very interesting topic is a uh, research uh, carried out by Analog Devices and, and also by the group by Professor Shanti Pavan, also a pioneer in, and, uh, and one of the 
most uh, experts in, the, in this topic of continuous time in Sigma Delta, which are, they are applying the benefits of continuous time, not only to Sigma Delta, but also to, to pipeline uh, ADCs. No? And the benefits of continuous time is that uh, uh, basically because you can achieve fa a faster operation with a less uh, power consumption, with a less energy per, uh, per conversion. No? That's the reason behind using this uh, this uh, circuit techniques instead of using switch capacitors that uh, are mostly used uh, in the cases in which uh, the you know the signal bandwidth is in the order of kilohertz or megahertz at, at most. But if you your uh, signal bandwidth is uh, above uh, one megahertz or ten megahertz, probably continuous time will be more much more efficient. No? So in this second part of my my talk, let me talk about uh, some imagine. Uh, uh, circuit and systems techniques around the, the you know ba these basics uh, ADCs that we have been talking no so I will start uh, mm, from my view talking about some emerging uh, uh, emerging uh, topics emerging strategies sorry related to the communication areas uh, in this case I'll talk about the so-called RF digitizers I mean. You know, the motivation for working on this or for doing research on this is the evolution of mobile telecoms. As you can see in the last uh, decade, we have seen how the different generations of uh, mobile systems are making our terminals, our mobile terminal more and more powerful, including more and more uh, uh, applications and, 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 and different uh, uh, communication standards and protocols and, and so on. And indeed, we are moving now towards uh, the uh, fifth generation, which is operating in the, depending on the type, I mean, the mode, operation mode that you are using for 5G, uh, we will need uh, circuits operating in the milli, milli, in millimeter wave uh, uh, frequency band or the sub, uh, sub uh, uh, six uh, gigahertz uh, frequency band, but regardless the, the the frequency operation, I mean the 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 trend is toward trying to translate most of the signal processing from the analog to the digital domain, so that ideally the the idea will be to to implement uh, radio receivers uh, based on the the so-called the software defined radio concept, which was uh, proposed by Mitola in the mid nineties. And ideally, this concept uh, try to uh, get the the signals coming from the I mean from the RF signals from the uh, from the wireless uh, from the, uh, environment and digitize this RF signal directly, you know, so that you can uh, make a, uh, implement a direct conversion from RF to the digital domain. So this would be ideal because uh, essentially you can process all. All, all the signal, uh, I mean, all the signal processing can be done in the digital domain with all the benefits uh, that come from the technology downscaling, the programmability, adaptability to many different standards, and, and so on. But the, the price to pay, as I, as I say here, is that uh, these added to digital, added to digital converters are very power hungry. So, in most, uh, most uh, this, of these applications that target, uh, say, a, a, a programmable, software different radio applications are based on the so-called direct conversion receivers in which you have uh, the configurable building blocks that can be programmed, can be reconfigured their uh, specification to different uh, standards, to different communication modes, and adapt this uh, specification to the, the, the different operation modes so that you first translate the, the RF signal to band, and there you can a digitize the signal and process digitally. So this is the, the approach. And here you have a list of uh, state-of-the-art uh, approaches uh, in which uh, you can see these two main strategies. For instance, here this, you can see the direct uh, conversion uh, approach in which uh, the RF signals are uh, translated to the baseband and uh, using, uh, for instance, a low pass in Delta or in any other converter like a pipeline or so on, you can digitize the signals. Uh, and the other alternative is to try to digitize signal directly in, in the RF domain. So you implement an RF to digital converter using a one passing model uh, modulator. I will I will show you some some examples later on. No? But uh, there is another interesting approach that has been proposed by several authors, and you can check it in some of the references that I'm giving in this in this talk, and you can see in the in the open literature that they, they are uh, uh, proposing what they call it the uh, signal data receivers. No? So they are 
replacing some of the uh, RF receiver building blocks like the mixer, the oscillator inside, uh, the, uh, I mean, the, the feedback uh, system, uh, which is provided by the signal delta modulator. So that some of the errors and the non-idealities associated to the local oscillator, the mixer, etc., can be uh, mitigated, can be reduced by the action of the, the feedback action of the signal delta modulation. No? So there are several interesting approaches. And indeed, in, in my group in the last year, we have been working on some of these strategies uh, based on, uh, indeed, I'm showing here some of the uh, successful uh, chips that uh, were designed by my one of my former students, which is now working in Infineon, which is the Dr. Alonso Morgado, uh, who designed several chips uh, for uh, multi-standard uh, telecom systems. And uh, the approach here was to, to use switch capacitors and reconfigurable switch capacitors techniques in order to base on basing based on or switch uh, on a reconfigurable scheme or switchable uh, ST networks you can adapt the performance of the system to the different specifications that you need not that in that in such a way you can uh, I mean you can adapt this performance in order to digitize different kind of signal from GSM to LTE, et cetera, no? So he uh, designed several different generations of uh, chips that were state of the art and was pub were published in, 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 in cutting edge uh, publications and were state of the art in, the, in, in, that, in the moment, no? And another strategy that we have followed uh, is based on continuous time, the domain. Also, this is a design also uh, in which it was mostly done by my, my colleague, uh, Dr. Alonso Morgado, in which here you have a uh, widely programmable continuous time bandpass ADC, which is able based on uh, using GNLC resonators, which are basically inverter based uh, uh, transconductors as the basic uh, unit elements that are, can be switchable. You can adapt uh, by switching, by connecting or disconnecting these uh, unitary elements. You can adapt the performance of the resonator. Or you can get a given number of uh, specific. I mean, the, the specification that you need for the resonators in order to adapt the performance, or in, in this case, in order to 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 tune the notch uh, frequency of the of, of the uh, of the bandpass modulator. For instance, you can see here how the notch frequency. I mean, the center frequency can be moved, can be uh, tuned, can be tunable. Indeed, this uh, in, pr in principle can be continuously uh, tunable or programmable. For different frequencies, depending on the standard communication standard that you want to to, to digitize, no. So it's all an interesting, very interesting approach. So more recently, we are now working uh, in an approach which is a multidisciplinary approach, in which uh, we are working in, uh, in my group together with uh, other colleagues uh, in my institute, which are who are experts in the uh, artificial intelligence and in particular in, uh, in neural, uh, artificial neural networks uh, based on the neuromorphic uh, signal processing. And we are applying these uh, techniques in order to, to use uh, what we call it, a, you know, an AI engine that can be used to control the operation of the overall system so that uh, this uh, software defined radio, I mean, these uh, uh, radio receivers, can adapt the performance, can re be reconfigurable in a, let's say, autonomous or automatic way so that they can, uh, for instance, uh, do this uh, programmable programmability in, a, uh, sorry, in, an, uh, in an automatic way if it is uh, controlled by an artificial intelligence engine, as you can see in a conceptual way here. No? So this is indeed part of uh, in this, the chip that you are showing here. So here is uh, indeed part of uh, an European project in which uh, we were working based on putting a uh, Menristor crossbar that you can see here, a Menristor cross crossbar on top of a CMOS uh, process in order to implement uh, the Menristor uh, are emulating the synapses between the, new, the artificial neurons which are implemented using CMOS transistor. So our final objective is to try to translate this technology to uh, and apply this technology to communications by embedding these uh, artificial intelligence uh, engines in order to control the operation of the different building blocks, mostly the analog and RF signal processing, in order to uh, adapt the performance of these uh, building blocks and the overall system uh, for a more efficient uh, 
uh, I mean, signal processing in general, no? in trying, trying to translate most of the signal processing to the digital domain. So let me show you some example that, uh, and some of the system level uh, that in which we are working now, system level um, architecture um, approaches in which we are working now. And indeed, this is an idea, um, I mean, some ideas that we are presenting, that we are going to present by one of our, our PhD students, Virginia Zuniga, that is going to present uh, in a couple of weeks in the ICECS uh, conference. And the idea is to use an LSTM neural network engine in order to control the operation of uh, uh, the different building blocks in a radio receiver in a, for uh, implementing the so-called cognitive radio receivers, which are uh, cognitive radio, maybe you know, are uh, radio receivers which uh, capture the information from, from the environment and try to identify which is the optimum bandwidth, the optimum band, in order to, to transmit the, the information. For instance, here you have an example that you, we will show in, the, in this paper that will, will be presented in a couple of weeks, in which uh, this is just an emulation of the band occupancy, the different channels uh, uh, occupancy, by measuring the power consumed uh, in, in each, uh, uh, in each uh, communication channel over the time. No? This is a dynamic signal, which is processed by, by this uh, LSTM network engine, and based on the um, uh, processing, uh, uh, identifying, based on the processing of this information, the LSTM network can identify the less occupied band. So that this is, uh, I mean, some details about the implementation of the LSTM network. I will not go into the in and outs of the details, but based on this uh, uh, artificial intelligence network, you can identify the less occupied signal band. And based on this information, you can process the, I mean, you can process the, the, the signal in, so, in such a way that you can move. Uh, for instance, in this example, we are applying the, the information provided by the, uh, this uh, network engine, I mean, neural network engine, in order to change the parameters of the bumper filter, in this case, the RF filter, so that depending on the uh, information captured from the, from the band occupancy, the neural network, in this case, the artificial intelligence engine, is able to, to change automatically in an, in an autonomous way in, and identify the best, uh, the best band in order to transmit the information. So this is something, this is the idea in which we are working now. But for, for the idea to the practical implementation, there are many, many things still to, to, to be done. No? Like for instance, think about which are the most appropriate uh, radio receiver architecture probably based on tunable Sigma Delta, Bampas Sigma Delta converter, which is the most appropriate uh, uh, indeed um, uh, neural network engine. There are different approaches that are uh, listed here. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, the AI uh, engine can be also used not only for the design, I mean, for, for implementing the design, but also as a part of the design methodology, like, uh, for instance, an optimization engine. And of course, uh, we need to use uh, digital-based, mostly digital circuit techniques in order to make the system, especially the analog and RF systems, subsystems, uh, more and more programmable in order to be, com I mean, controlled by this uh, artificial, I mean, in, in, sorry, uh, in uh, IA uh, engine. No? Uh, you can you can check this. Uh, you can see how there are more and more interest by many uh, researchers, and you can. Uh, take a look to to the to the to the uh, research of the state of the earth on this topic, uh, and you can identify different strategies that uh, people are following. No, like for instance, you've seen uh, trans cybers, like this one is very very interesting based on a delta sigma energy detection technique. And this all other one which in which they are implementing an RF to digital converter based on a band pass sigma delta, which is able to tune the the I mean the notch frequency in order to digitize uh, gigahertz frequency, which is uh, and it's uh, so very, very competitive uh, design. And also uh, using multi-channel approaches, the use of NPAP, and uh, of course, uh, embedding uh, image rigid filtering, like the works we carry out by the group, by the Professor Santi Pran also, it's very interesting in the, in the, in the continuous time, similar converters, 
also very very important in order to regulate the, the I mean the the images images in the in the radio receivers and the, in the signal processing. So you have to take into account all these uh, these techniques in order to implement these ideas in in practice. No? So let me talk. Uh, this is for communication. Let me talk about other strategies that are being uh, you know investigated uh, now in order to implement uh, more efficient uh, digitizers like and one of the trends is indeed uh, uh, implementing uh, what they call it OPAM or OTA less uh, circuit implementation no? so the idea was uh, uh, initially proposed uh, by several authors no? but uh, in terms of the uh, ADCs was uh, one of the first uh, successful approximations uh, sorry implementations was uh, proposed by Dr. Shah uh, more than 10 years ago and it, it consisted on replacing the the OTAs in in in, in, in the converter by a simple inverter. No, of course it has many practical limitations. But uh, over the year, there have been more and more uh, people trying to improve these techniques in order to make this inverter-based uh, uh, converters in general not only applied for Sigma Delta. I'm sure we hear an example of Sigma Delta, but this can be applied also to other kinds of digitizers that are indeed uh, nowadays uh, cutting edge uh, uh, chips, uh, obtaining a state-of-the-art result. So very interesting, very interesting approach this one. No? And also uh, based on the using only passive element, passive circuit element like this one no? uh, is uh, one of the uh, one of the first uh, successful approaches of implementation of a almost fully uh, passive implementation of the filter, no? only using switch capacitor filter. The only indeed active element is indeed the the the, the, the comparator in the in the in the in the converter, no. And you can see here the the power consumption is in the order of micro micro watts, uh, so very very low. But you can also extend this concept to continuous time uh, uh, circuit techniques in order to try to digitize signals with a higher, uh, with a wider uh, signal bandwidth. Now, as you can see here in this example, which was proposed by the, the group of uh, Professor Joao Goes in, in Lisbon, and it was published some years ago in the International Solicitative Conference. And over the years, there are many, many people uh, uh, proposing in this uh, more and more interesting uh, uh, research uh, strategies based on this idea or combining passive and active elements in order to make the loop filter more efficient and more in terms of energy. No? One of the, uh, another strategy, not, it is not only at the circuit level, but also at the system level, like this one that you can see here, that uh, it was a work in which I participated in collaboration with the group like Professor Mohamed Sawan at the Polytechnic de Montreal, that was done uh, by the Dr. Mohamed Horna Parvar. It was a very interesting approach in which uh, they move it only the, the other, this other, which is very power hungry, they uh, he moved this other to, uh, in, 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 instead of placing the, the other in, in this point, he, he placed the other before the, the, the second integrator in the, in the loop. So only doing this, in, uh, simple, uh, this simple change, you can reduce uh, the energy consumed a lot. So these are interesting, but it's in principle simple ideas of system level and that of course you can further improve if, if you use inverter base or even uh, hybrid um, passive active uh, circuit, uh, circuit techniques that you can uh, you can use in order to get a, a state of the air performance that this was the case of this circuit not that was uh, uh, achieving a state of the earth in uh, his range of applications you can see in this uh, in this slide no so in the in mobile uh, terminals, it is also important not only mm, take care about uh, in terms of power consumption, not only take care about the, the the signal processing, but also in terms of the energy. I mean the the power management, at least, which is directly related to the I mean to the to the battery battery life. And here, in, in, it is also very important to uh, to integrate some kind, let's say, of intelligence. And this is uh, usually done by using um, ADCs, uh, mostly SAR ADCs, which are control the energy consumed by the overall system, in which is called the power the power management systems. And here I, you can see an example of one of our PhD students, that common PhD student, uh, did this work on a SAR converter in collaboration. This was the result of a collaboration with the group by the Dr. Ivan O'Connell in. Uh, 
Lindal Institute in Ireland, very interesting approach in which they were uh, uh, they were proposing, in this case, uh, the, the, the work that was mostly carried out as part of the PhD of uh, uh, Sohail Lasgar, who was uh, the main designer, who proposed uh, this cell converter that it was able to digitize signals that uh, in which the input range was indeed over the uh, supply voltages. Uh, this is very important because uh, you can't uh, reduce the, the, I mean, the energy consumed by the overall system, and in particular, it's very interesting in terms of the operation of the power management system. So it was uh, also uh, obtaining a state-of-the-art performance based on a, a number of techniques that are shown here, but I will not go into the, the details, essentially using the input sample onto the bottom plates of the most significant bits and using a, a special, you know, the, how you say, Submented uh, architecture, not uh, which are interesting. No, so this is for uh, uh, you know uh, some strategies to reduce the energy consumed by some circuit techniques. So let me talk about some one of the uh, also hot topics nowadays in, in digital and uh, in, in analog to digital converter, which is trying to to use uh, what they call the it is called the time based or frequency based signal processing. So the idea is uh, instead of using uh, an amplitude-based quantizer, which is a classical quantizer, the idea is to use a time-based uh, quantizer. And the motivation for doing this is uh, because if you use a time-based quantizer, you you, uh, you know codifies the, the quantization in time domain instead of the in the amplitude domain, it is uh, it can benefit from the technology downscaling. So this is the main idea is that it was proposed by Dr. Strayer uh, more than 10 years ago, as you can see in this slide, it is very, I mean, the concept is simple, but it's not so simple to, to, to implement, as you can see here. The idea is to replace the, the uh, uh, classical quantizer by an oscillator-based quantizer, as you can see here. The ring, a ring oscillator counts the number of edges within a given time period, and this uh, gives you the digital representation of the input amplitude. This is the way in which you codify the information in time domain, instead of an amplitude domain. So that is a, there has been an increased interest of uh, these techniques uh, over the years. As you can see in some of the uh, references that I put here, there are many more. And I strongly recommend you to read uh, this uh, overview paper. Uh, I think it's two part paper that has been, well, um, I mean, written by Professor George Gillen and uh, Luis Hernandez and Peter Rumbutz, uh, and as you can see in the Solid State Circuit Magazine. First uh, part of this uh, paper was published in the spring uh, issue of this magazine. And here you can see a good, a very good overview. This, all of them are uh, well, worldwide experts in, in this topic. But uh, as I said before, the idea is very simple, but uh, put this idea in practice is, uh, is, uh, has many problems. No? And one of the main problems is related to the nonlinearity of the PCO. And this is uh, in, imposing a serious limitation if the number of architectures that you can implement and in the, in, in, indeed, we have been working also in cooperation with uh, again with uh, uh, um, Professor Mohamed Sawan groups uh, as part of the PhD of Dr. Mohamed Hona Parwark uh, PhD, uh, and we propose an, a cascade topology that uses a gate switch ring oscillator that allow us to increase the order of the filter of the ADC by combining, uh, you know, the benefits of the continuous time. Uh, circuit techniques with time domain, uh, time based quantization. No? So the, the, the chip also feature a state of the air performance, as you can see in this, uh, in this slide. And it is also a very interesting approach. And indeed, as you are going down into the deep nanometer uh, CMOS uh, technologies, it is also very interesting to try to, to get benefits from the nanoscale. Uh, uh, technology process like uh, the FDSOI uh, technologies, which uh, are being uh, uh, fabricated by several foundries like, uh, like for instance, ST Microelectronics, in which we have been uh, working in the last year, like in the 28 nanometer FDSOI, that allow use to use the enhanced body effects, as you can see here, uh, for the MOS and PMOS transistors, and you can use this uh, enhanced uh, body efforts in order to um, get uh, 
better performance in terms of the analog uh, signal processing, in terms of the analog circuit design in general. No? For instance, here I am showing some results that we published recently in Natika's uh, paper that was mostly done by um, one of our uh, PhD students, Javad uh, Almadi uh, Fars Farsani, in which we demonstrated that, for instance, if we apply these techniques, uh, FDSOI, controlling the bulk, uh, taking benefits of the uh, bulk input control of the local oscillator, we can reduce the non-linearity, I mean, the harmonic distortion as compared to classical approach. For instance, here you can see the non-linearity, the non-linear error of a classical, uh, you know, conventional uh, VCO. And here you can see the non-linearity in a FDSOI uh, using the techniques that we propose in this uh, in this uh, Richard book. So it's very interesting what you can see how you can reduce the, 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 the I mean the harmonic distortion, the non-linearity, and this can be translated to the to to implement different uh, I mean uh, uh, analog uh, analog systems like uh, in this case uh, VCO based uh, digitizers, no? in which you can see here how using gate input versus bulk input, so you can see how the, using the bulk input, you can reduce uh, the non-linearity uh, to, to some extent also. It's very, very interesting approach. So the last part of my presentation, yeah, this is just to, to conclude uh, my, my presentation. In the last section, of, uh, of, uh, I will show you how we can benefit of the different strategies of ADCs in order to combine them in so-called hybrid ADCs in order to take advantage of the different uh, techniques, SAR, pipeline, and SIMA delta to, in order to get uh, more efficient ADCs in terms of, uh, in, in terms of the energy consumed, the power consumption. So let me start by, by indeed, uh, uh, one of the first approaches to this uh, idea that indeed it is not new at all. It was proposed more than 20 uh, years ago by the group uh, by Professor Gulli in Stanford University in which they replaced the quantizer of uh, simulator converters by a pipeline ADC. So in the end, the, you can increase the, 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 I mean the, the resolution of the quantizer so that in the end the resolution of the ADC can be uh, can, can be extend, I mean, can be increased a, a lot, taking benefits from the sigma delta um, uh, I mean and robustness and the uh, uh, you know the increased resolution of the pipeline that you play, uh, that you use in order to, to implement the, the, the quantizer. So this approach has been extended in the last year uh, by combining, by in, embedding SAR and, uh, and asynchronous, asynchronous SAR and SAR converters in order to implement the quantization in the in a, in a sigma delta loop. As you can see here, there are many, many uh, in, in state of the art designers using this approach in which you benefit from this hybrid architecture no? of sigma delta and SAR converters in order to get um, uh, a state-of-the-art performance. And as I mentioned before, you can also combine time-based signal processing, for instance, using BCO-based quantizers or BCO-based delta sigma converters with SAR converters, as you can see in these two, in these two pictures, in these two architectures and uh, I am showing here. No? And here you, you have uh, a two-stage, I will say, um, two-stage uh, uh, converter and in one of the, the front end stage it's a SAR converter and the back end stage is a BCO so that the non-linearities of the BCO are attenuated by the action of the front end converter. So this is mostly the main idea behind this uh, this approach that can be used in order to get a really really good uh, good performance. Huh? So another approach, like one of the last that I'm going to mention uh, in my presentation today, is to to try to uh, to to get the benefits of SAR converters and noise shaping, uh, and the noise shaping provided by sigma delta, and the resulted uh, ADC is called uh, noise shaping SAR. So the basic idea is to use a SAR converter and take the residue that results from the I mean from the TAC logic that you implement in the SAR converter, and, and by applying a convenient filter, you can emulate the performance of a noise shaping but taking the benefits of the SARC conversion, I mean, the SARC logic and the SARC uh, uh, ADC and the, 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 the sigma delta uh, modulation techniques. So very, very interesting approach in which uh, we are, and you can see in the state of the art that they are obtaining uh, very, very good results on the cutting edge uh, of the state of the art. So uh, following the same idea, 
you can use a two-step uh, um, or semi-flash uh, converter, but instead of using the flash SARC converters, you can, uh, you can replace the flash converters by the SARC uh, ADCs and DACs. So that the, the, the main benefits of this uh, approach is that the, the system is becoming more and more digital, so that benefits from the technology downscaling. So this is also getting very good results because of the mostly digital uh, flower of this uh, architecture that can be extended to a pipeline as well. No? So this is a pipeline SAR in which you have a, a, you know, a multi-stage uh, ADC in which each, each stage is indeed a, a two-stage semi-flash converter, but the, the, the main, I mean, the, the conversion uh, strategy that uh, you are using is a, is a SAR converter, so also very, very interesting. And the, the last one, the, the, just to conclude my, my presentation, is to try to get benefits of using um, parallel conversion. Indeed, I started, uh, almost started my presentation talking about flash converters. So the idea here is uh, to use a similar approach, a parallel conversion, but using time interleaving, time interleaving conversion, but using SAR converters, because SAR ADCs are very power efficient uh, ADC conversion techniques, so you can combine SAR ADCs in a uh, time interleaved way so that uh, you can uh, obtain very good performance results, especially in terms of their, uh, uh, in terms of speed. You can see here a couple of examples that I, I, I took from the state of the earth, uh, implemented in, in 28 nanometer CMOS technology, and you can see how the, the, the can shift uh, performance, which uh, is able to, to digitize signals in, in the order of, uh, in the range of tens of gigahertz, giga samples per second. So it's a very, very interesting approach. Of course, the resolution is limited mostly by the mismatch of the, I mean, and the, the, the branches that you use in the, uh, in the time interleaf uh, architecture, but it's something that uh, depending on the, I mean, uh, on the resolution that you are targeting, you can compensate this, uh, this uh, limitations no? in order to get a more efficient, uh, uh, in the end, uh, energy efficient approach. So to conclude uh, my presentation today, just uh, let me show you some summary and, uh, summary and some conclusions. So mentioned that we are living in a, uh, what is called a digital transformation of our society in which, uh, of course, electronic systems are key components and key players of this, uh, new economy and all, as I was mentioning uh, at the beginning of my presentation, the post-industrial uh, uh, society and ADCs are in the key uh, technology enablers of these uh, electronic systems. And in order to get an efficient implementation of the uh, devices in this digital transformation, uh, in the IoT era and the 5G and 6G in this uh, mobile telecom system, and the corresponding mobile mo uh, nodes uh, require looking to innovative solutions that is increasingly uh, uh, demanding a specification in terms of the power efficiency, which is leading to new generations of uh, digitizers. And the state of the air that you have seen is dominated by the, these three kind of converters, are pipeline and sigma delta, but as well by, as uh, hybrid uh, combinations, uh, by combination of this one is uh, hybrid architecture that combine the benefits of these uh, techniques. So the integrated circuit and system design at the nanoscale, for instance, uh, using uh, 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 the, the benefits, uh, using the advantages of the uh, deep uh, nan nanoscale technologies uh, can, can be applied in order to implement a digital assisted, mostly digital, uh, 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 approaches and use, for instance, techniques, signal processing techniques like time-based or time to digital conversion instead of amplitude-based quantization is also very interesting in terms of uh, the scalability of this kind of uh, uh, converters uh, as you are uh, uh, entering into the nanoscale, uh, in, into the nanoscale of this technology. And of course, uh, if you are able to embed some kind of artificial in intelligence and genes uh, together with these techniques, you can make a more and more uh, efficient uh, ADCs, which is a very prom uh, promising solution in order to implement the so-called cognitive radio and software-defined electronics in general, and also all this software-defined radio. So addressing all these challenges in the incoming uh, deep nanometer uh, CMOS technology, 
uh, will lead us uh, to new uh, implementation of ABCs, which uh, uh, are becoming more and more uh, uh, efficient in this, uh, as uh, it is mentioned in the slide, in this uh, more and more digital driving, driving work. So this is all for my talk today. Thank you so much for attending uh, my presentation and, and I'm open to your uh, question, curiosities and some discussion. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Professor uh, Jose. It was it was really really nice presentation. I, I do have uh, several questions of my own because uh, uh, I work with uh, right. receivers as well, right? But uh, let's let's start with the audience questions, right? So we have one question from uh, Jeff Shi from uh, San Diego, California. So uh, his question is, what is the state of the performance band pass and quadrant through Delta Sigma ADCs in terms of communication applications? State of the art and, and quadrature, that's a very good but, question. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what uh, it, uh, I mean, uh, it means in terms of the state of the art, it depends on the resolution that you are targeting. But usually, I'm not sure about the quadrature uh, topology. But in general, uh, the resolution that you are able to achieve uh, if you are digitizing directly RF uh, signals in the order of, uh, let's say, uh, in the order of a few gigahertz, uh, in, in terms of, uh, the, I mean, the frequency band, the resolution uh, it typically is in the order of 10, 11 bits. Of course, you can use quadrature and pass in Modelta, but the most, uh, in, my, in my view, the most uh, simple approach is better because when you introduce the quadrature, uh, you know, topology, it can, of course, it has the benefits of the quadrature in this uh, approach, but it has also some uh, problems due to the, I would say, the, and the mismatch between the uh, in phase and the, and, and uh, I mean, the, the the two phases in the in the quadrature uh, architecture in general. No, so I would say that in general, the trends in my in my view, the trends are towards a more simple uh, analog uh, content in the architecture. I mean, it's a mostly digital approach, so that uh, in, indeed the state of the earth is uh, using continuous time, of course, uh, single loop architectures, and uh, it is uh, whenever it's possible, try to use uh, the simple uh, circuit techniques uh, uh, as possible, no? most uh, simple techniques as possible. So quadrature, of course, is an option, but honestly, it is uh, sometimes uh, have many problems due to the mismatch between the channels in the in the quadrature, no? in general. No? I would say that, that no? but there are also, of course, putting edge uh, architecture. No? Okay, so uh, continuing in this in this uh, topic, right? I have a question of my own. Uh, actually, when uh, when you were you you were thinking not only state of the art but uh, also state of the art for IoT, right? You are really worried about the power consumption, right? And uh, for the IoT, the number of bits is, is, is really usually small, like uh, eight bits, nine bits. Uh, sometimes quadrature is, is, is important depending on the modulation as well, right? Yeah. Well, so so uh, usually we, we we consider SAR applications for that. So can, can you comment a little bit on, on it? Of course. In this case, uh, it is for sure if you take a look, the, uh, I'm not sharing the screen, but I, I, can, I can just tell you, no? if you if you take a look uh, at the state of the earth, uh, SAR ADCs are clearly dominating the, the state of the earth in terms of energy, from, uh, I mean, in terms of power consumption, whenever the resolution that you are targeting is uh, below the, let's say, 11, 12 bits. So if for any application, that you need to, to digitize signals with uh, 11, 12 bits or below, probably SAR converters will be better. Indeed, uh, SAR ADCs are uh, increasing the resolution without being so penalized by the power consumption if you try to embed some kind of noise shaping, what is it called the noise shaping SAR. So for the application that you are mentioning, it is, it's, it's, it's true that for in many cases for IoT, for many, I mean, applications around IoT, 
which is, are many different applications, but in general, as you say, the most important thing is the power consumption and the resolution is not so high. So probably the SAR conversion will be the best, uh, the best approach in that, in, in that case, in my, in my view. Okay. Yeah, I have another question of my own, which is uh, regarding the, the continuous time versus the discrete time uh, approach, right? Mm -hmm. So, so uh, in terms of looking at the, the, these IoT applications, for instance, and looking at uh, maybe more mature technologies like uh, 180 nanometers, so uh, can you comment on, on these uh, trade-offs between the continuous and the discrete time, if we're thinking about uh, SAR application, for instance? This is another good, good question because uh, uh, usually, you know, or better say traditionally, a continuous time uh, has been used, of course, for, field, for um, designing filters, of course, uh, and also for designing SIMA data converters. But recently, uh, there are uh, very interesting works uh, uh, um, that try to translate the benefits of continuous time uh, that has been demonstrated in, in the SIMA Delta world, let's say, to other kinds of converters, like for instance, pipeline. And indeed, I mentioned in, in, in my talk, I, maybe I, I went very fast, that there is a very interesting research carried out by the, the, you know, the people from analog devices, uh, in particular, I know the Dr. Ajin Shibata, and also by the group of uh, Professor Santi Pavan, and they have published recently uh, some interesting works on pipeline a continuous time pipeline. So this is a challenge because they are uh, replacing, you know, traditionally pipeline ADCs uh, are synchronous uh, systems and um, have been implemented mostly using switch capacitor circuits. So uh, at this moment, I don't see, uh, you know, why not you cannot apply, extend or you cannot apply the, the, the same idea to other kind of converters, like for instance, SARS. I, I don't have the, I, I mean, I don't have the, you know, the architecture in mind, no, but uh, why not? If, if you can apply to pipeline, why not uh, can, cannot apply to SAR? Whenever you are able to implement some kind of uh, synchronization in order to implement the logic of the, of the SAR, maybe it is possible, no? I don't know if it was a good question because you mentioned something that maybe I missed something about the technology, no? Because you were mentioning mm -hmm. about the going uh, 18 micrometer. The yeah, yeah, if, if you like, uh... If there are many impacts, if, if you change from uh, a newer technology when you are considering continuous or discrete time? Of course, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Indeed, uh, it depends, again, it depends on the application, not always going down. Indeed, this is an issue and it is a challenge, it's a, it's a problem. If you try to use a deep nano, nanometer CMOS technology for implementing ADCs, it is not necessarily uh, better for the, I mean, the efficiency of a converter. And indeed, if you take a look to the state of the air, now I don't have the data, but in the last study that I did, indeed, uh, I think that, the, you know, most of the cutting edge uh, ADCs have been designed using 0.13 uh, micrometer CMOS technology, which is not, <laughs> you know, so, how you say, uh, cutting edge uh, technology, no? But you know what is the problem? The problem is that uh, in many cases, at least that was my experience in the in, in the past when I was working in in I mean in collaboration with uh, some industrial partners, that uh, usually the ADC is integrated in the in the same chip as the digital signal processor, for instance, and use and the the DST usually try to get benefit from the downscaling and try to be implemented in a deep nanometer CMOS. So this is the motivation for using, deep, uh, I mean, deep nanometer or nanometer or, you know, a very, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 very good technology, you know? I mean, very new, newer technologies compared to, let's say, more mature uh, technologies. But it is not necessarily better. And there are plenty of uh, examples that you can see in the, in the literature where there are many people showing state-of-the-art performance using point 18 uh, micrometer CMOS technology, for instance. No? So uh, in terms of the continuous time versus the switch capacitor, probably the problem comes from the uh, supply voltage. Of course, as you know, there are several alternatives uh, in order to, for instance, as a boost, boost trapping switches or, uh, or similar, 
that you can use in switch capacitor in order to mitigate the impact of the, I mean, the supply voltage down downscaling. And in this, in this, I mean, from this point of view, maybe continuous time will be, you know, uh, advantageous. And of course, mm -hmm. whenever you want to digitize signals uh, that uh, have a bandwidth over one megahertz, 10 megahertz, for sure, continuous time, regardless of the technology, continuous time uh, techniques will be better or will be more uh, power efficient than switch capacitor, no? I, I don't know if I answered your yeah, no, no, thanks. Thank you. Really nice. It's difficult yeah. sometimes to talk in general terms because it, sometimes it depends on the particular uh, application. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, we, we attended one presentation a couple of weeks ago with Professor uh, Pelgrim, Marcel Pelgrim, and he was talking. He, he really liked the 0.18 micrometers for, for ADC SAR, right? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's really good thing. I agree, I agree. Very good technology. Yeah. Yes. Of course. Yeah, okay. So uh, going ahead here, uh, we have uh, from uh, Taimur Habuski. Uh, great talk. Uh, what are your thoughts on the digital calibration for sigma delta modulators? How effectively can it mitigate uh, uh, DAC mismatch, integrator leakage, and uh, other sort of sources of errors in uh, sigma delta ADCs? Yeah, of course. Of course. Uh... This is another general question that uh, I don't have a, a, you know, a clear answer no, to uh, mm -hmm. so general question, but of course, digital calibration techniques, I mentioned not in the context of uh, uh, Sigma Delta, but in the context of uh, time interlead uh, SAR converters. But uh, of course, if you are using multi-big tags, you will need some kind of linearization uh, techniques like the uh, DEM or uh, digital calibration. And of course, this can can be, uh, benefit, of course, from the mm, uh, technology downscaling as well. And as you are moving the signal processing from the analog to the digital domain, uh, there are many things that you can do uh, in the digital part of the ADC. And you can apply, of course, digital calibration of one, uh, with uh, any other techniques of probably at the price of uh, increasing the latency or maybe other uh, specifications or performance metrics of the ADC will be penalized. But uh, these are techniques that whenever they are implemented in the digital domain will be, will benefit from the technology downscaling. So uh, I completely agree. So I am in favor of these uh, techniques whenever you are going to a mostly digital approach. No? But again, yeah. connecting, sorry, connecting to the first question about quadrature, in my experience, I try to, to whenever I, I can avoid, uh, you know, to make the, the design more complex, I do it. You know, if you can do it more simple, I, I, I follow that approach. Yeah. That's the general rule. And no, yeah. other as well, no? Always thinking about power, right? So we have to do that. It's usually the, the simpler is the less power hungry, right? Yeah. So uh, in in this uh, in the presentation I did it was it was it was very nice that it, you showed this uh, artificial intelligence that it's very aligned with this uh, calibration thing right so it's uh, it's it's like a good good uh, perspective on that uh, from Gerardo Molina Salgado uh, his question is about uh, the noise shaping so. Do you think noise shaping SARS can replace Sigma Delta? I, I think you, you said that it, there's a good trend in this sense, right? Replace is a very strong word, right? Uh, I would not say replace, uh, but uh, of course they can complement uh, Sigma Delta converters. And as I said in the conclu in conclusions of, of my talk, uh, I think that uh, this is my view, of course, no? that uh, in my opinion, I think that uh, in the in the end, hybrid converters uh, will benefit from the, I mean, the advantages of the different techniques. And this is a good example. And did I show in one of the slides that the uh, noise shaping SAR are, in my view, are more SAR ADCs than Sigma Delta converters. They mm -hmm. are implementing noise shaping and there are different approaches in order to implement this idea. I didn't go into the in and out, so, because I didn't have time not to give all the details. But, uh, it, the spirit behind uh, noise shaping SAR converters is to implement a SAR ADC that has also the, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the performance uh, enhancement 
that you can achieve, uh, including this, uh, this uh, signal processing technique, which is noise shaping. So the question is, it will replace. <laughs> Honestly, I, I don't know if it will replace, no? But uh, probably the, it will complement. I would say complement, not replace. They, they will get a good uh, good space probably in the future, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, a question here from uh, uh, Paulo Cesar Comaceto Jaguiri. Thanks for the very nice talk. So, uh, May you comment on the most suitable Sigma Delta configuration architecture for 5G? So, if you are looking at 5G. Yeah, yeah, indeed, uh, we're working in, the, in some projects now uh, for this uh, kind of applications. And, and again, I don't have a general answer, no? And uh, a clear answer, no? But uh, of course, in principle, RF digitizers, in which uh, there are many people working on that, uh, RF to digital converter, mostly based on bandpass. Uh, continuous time uh, sigma delta are for sure one of the most promising approaches, but the problem of, of the price to pay is the power consumption again. So, for instance, if you talk with uh, people from industry, most people say that uh, I pre they prefer to translate the signal in the analog domain to baseband and then digitize the signal using a direct conversion receiver, for instance. No, so it would depend on the, of the, of the receiver architecture. No, so probably. The ideal approach will be to use an RF2 digital converter by using, for instance, a bandpass in Delta modulator using continuous time uh, circuit techniques. But, the, but we need to implement the, I mean, the loop filter in such a way that it somehow need to benefit from the technology downscaling, implementing a mostly digital approach in order to reduce the power consumption. Because otherwise, it is not so power efficient and probably the solution from the system level point of view will be better to think about the which is the you know best receiver approach, receiver architecture approach. And nowadays, probably in terms of energy uh, efficiency, in terms of the overall system, can be translate the signal to the baseband and then apply there any other you know baseband and digit uh, digitizers. Huh? If you ask me, I am in favor of using, or I, I like a lot the idea of translating the, uh, uh, you know, RF signal to the digital domain. So indeed, I'm working on that. <laughs> but uh, that's the problem, no? The problem is that it's uh, power consumption. It's uh, very limited by power. It's very power hungry approach. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you mentioned that is that is that's uh, uh, the most important thing when you're looking at power, right, is, is think about the system, not the ADC itself, but all the system, right? So the decisions should be all in the same direction, right? Uh, we have another question here from, from Jeff Shi. This, uh, how is blockers handling the state of their communication bandpass quadrature ADCs? I, I, I would say that uh, they, are, they were mostly handled by the, 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 the stages up front, right? Not by the ADC itself, right? Uh, but uh, can you comment on that? Can you comment on the, uh, because I, for some reason I, I lost the, the first part of the I'm question. I cannot yeah, see the, the question is, uh, how, how are blockers handled uh, when we are thinking about uh, band pass and quadrature ADCs? And, and I was thinking that uh, it, it, it's probably have to come first, right? Like we, with the anti-aliasing or, or the whole receiver, LNA, et cetera, before, right? But, uh, yeah. but can, can you comment on that? This is a very, very good question, and it is, in my view, it's also connected to the previous question as well, because you have to think about the overall system, as you mentioned as well. So, mm -hmm. uh, it's important, I'm talking about this, the, I mean, the, the resolution, I'm talking about the power consumption, but, uh, for instance, in a signal processing, in a radio receiver, for instance, you have many, many other important problems and limitations, like, for instance, the effect of uh, images that you have mm -hmm. to take into account, uh, the out-of-band blockers as well. So it, this is linked to, to you know the um, to the I would say the architecture design. No, you you need to think uh, to, to think about the, the 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 overall system performance, and to think about which is the most uh, convenient way of distribute the signal processing among the different blocks. For instance, the ideal software defined radio will be to take the signal from the antenna and digitize the signal there. But the problem again is the power consumption. No, uh, mm -hmm. due to the we need an RF to digital converter with uh, 
in my view, with unfeasible uh, uh, specifications nowadays. No? So you need to include at least an LNA, uh, at least a bandpass filter uh, and a bandpass in mm -hmm. converter. So you, you need to properly model your building blocks. This is a very important research topic at the system level. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you save a lot of power and you, you can achieve a, a more, much more efficient design, not only at the ADC level, but I'm talking about all other building blocks in your system, for instance, in a receiver. If mm -hmm. you do a good job at the system level, it's very important the system level modeling and how you distribute the, 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 the I mean, the specification mm -hmm. and the power, the power consumed uh, by each building block in the, in the architecture. So here you have to, to study many things, no? Which is the most appropriate uh, architecture in terms of the receiver? How you are, are you going to distribute? Uh, I mean, the signal processing in terms of the resolution, in terms of the gain of the LNA, uh, the linearity of the LNA, for instance, uh, was related to the question. Mm -hmm. So I don't have a general answer, no. But my my advice would be to carefully think uh, at the system level and spend the time needed at the system level because uh, it can make your life uh, easier at the circuit mm -hmm. and physical level. This is my experience, uh, at least. Yeah, yeah I like, we have a saying in Brazil is that uh, uh, sometimes we have uh, like a, a, a short blanket, so you cannot cover the head or the feet at the same time. Yeah. So we have to try to, 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 to improve that. <laughs> Yeah, right, absolutely right. Yeah, so uh, I think we have uh, uh, the last question here from uh, Jean Daloglu. He's talking about the, the hybrid ADCs, right? Uh, that have a uh, uh, larger velocity, uh, but uh, may have uh, more space, may, may, may occupy more space in the silicon, right? So uh, the question is if, if it is good in terms of that uh, when you are looking at uh, RF circuits that also have a very big uh, space in terms of uh, silicon. Do you mean the, the silicon area? Yeah, the silicon area. Yeah. The reality that the question is by Professor Palomino. Professor uh -huh. Palomino. Oh, yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you. I, I see, I can see. Um, I think that in terms of uh, silicon area, I don't see any, um, in, in general, I don't see any uh, um, pe a penalty or any, any disadvantage of using an, an hybrid converter as compared to, a, let's say, a pure converter like the one inside. Using an hybrid, let's say, SAR pipeline as compared to using a Sigma Delta uh, converter. It depends on the, again, depends on the design. This is one point. And another important point is that if you are targeting, a, a, you, you are thinking of, uh, which is the most common uh, approach to embed all the circuit elements on the same chip, probably the, the inductors will be the most, uh, you know, area hungry, no? You know, they will be occupying the most, uh, the most, most, I mean, a big portion of the, of the chip uh, uh, silicon area, no? So I, I will not say that, uh, I will not worry about the, you know, the silicon area, especially in RF uh, applications, no? Because uh, mm -hmm. there are the passive components, especially the inductors, will consume most of the area no, in, the, in this application, regardless the kind of ADC you are, you are using. No? Yeah, and, and it's still better if you put them inside, right? Otherwise, you have to put them on the board, which is worse. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> it depends. Again, it it yeah. depends. There are different yeah. technologies to you to implement the, the inductors as well, so... It yeah, depends. it's very hard, yeah. So. Thank you very much again. Uh, it, was, it was really a nice pleasure to have you here uh, for this uh, great talk. Thank you. Thank you for your invitation. It was a very great pleasure and, um, and a great honor for me to, to share this uh, talk with you and, and, and my friends and colleagues uh, from the from, uh, Porto Alegre, from uh, Rio Grande do Sul chapter. And it is, uh, as I said at the beginning of my presentation, this is a very, very interesting initiative and very nice, especially in these difficult times that we are all living around the globe. So uh, thank you so much for sharing this, uh, this uh, you know, series of talks uh, over the internet, uh, taking advantage of uh, the, our 
you know, communication technologies and YouTube and so on. So I'm very glad to participate. So I appreciate a lot your, your efforts to put all this in, in March. Thank you so much.